And it's this concept of the rage economy. And the rage economy is, you know, kind of like the uh, outrage culture, kind of the, the culture of social media. But the concept of the rage economy also speaks to the value of attention. And the kind of lengths that people increasingly take to get attention, and in particular, the way in which the media industry kind of uses rage, and in particular, social media platforms use rage to gather people's attention and to monetize that attention. So there's an interesting article uh, from our friends at The Intercept that sort of looks at the rise of the rage economy in, in the context of way, what they refer to as kind of the post-journalism era. And so here's this tweet, given that the rate of technological change has far outpaced our cultural institution's ability to process and thus familiarize it for us, the least we can do is endeavor on a personal level to not let ourselves be emotionally manipulated by technology. And, you know, that's kind of our through line for today's show is the emotional impact of technology and how technology uses our emotions to perhaps make, make that technology more effective, maybe even make our brains more effective. But it also evokes this notion of manipulation. And, and that's in particular how this article from The Intercept, which I found off this tweet, that's how it sort of frames it, right? That, you know, this is how to understand the rage economy in post-journalism, media ecologist Andrew Meir analyzes the way that the news economy shapes our perceptions of reality. And, you know, I, I, I'm obviously, as a media ecologist myself, interested in this notion of the rage economy. But I have a bunch of issues that I take with the framing of this article, and in particular, this, this concept of post-journalism. So I have a few paragraphs that I want to quote lower down in the article, but I... You know, I, I felt it was important to, to start with the introduction so that we know what they're arguing. Let me just increase the text here. The attack on the U.S. Capitol on January 6th underlined a disturbing phenomenon that has become undeniable at this point. The fragmentation of the American public into a multitude of angry factions, radicalized in different ways online, and holding completely different baseline perceptions of reality. The problem of deliberate misinformation undermining democracy has received lots of attention, but in many ways the power of fantastic lies to grab people's allegiance is also a byproduct of a deeper problem. Extreme polarization driven by news media monetizing anger in order to survive. And, and so that's why they frame it as post-journalism. They're, they're trying to argue that the rage economy, the anger that people feel, the, the, the perception that our, our world is increasingly polarized, they want to frame that on media organizations that are beating tribal drums and, and are becoming more extreme or more outrageous as a ploy to get attention. And I think that that is worth examining, but I, I first want to start with this concept of post-journalism because I kind of think it's bullshit, right? I think journalism has always been a myth, right? Journalism ha has been a way to establish authority for the purposes of selling advertising because certainly as long as I've ever been alive, the, the news business has been about getting attention to sell ads and whether they claimed that they were objective or journalistic or not was, was you know, just make-believe. It, it, it was just a superficial kind of cover to justify why you should trust them, why you should tune in, why, why you should, you know, be the loyal follower of that newscast and therefore watch their ads and, and therefore help them make money on those ads. And I kind of feel that we've matured as a society to recognize that the inherent subjectivity of the world and that while there's a role for news, while there's a role for journalism, you know, I, I don't think there is anything called objectivity anymore. And I think the fact that we're polarizing is not because we all have found our voices. It's not because any of us can be here on Twitch and create a new show. 
No, I, I think there's a larger shift at play when it comes to the way in which the rage economy is rising and the way in which we make money on the rage economy. And I feel that this is a, an important question because we as Twitch streamers, we're always wondering how do we get attention, right? How do we get more followers? How do we get more people onto our stream? And, you know, we could come to the conclusion that it's through outrage, that it's through embellishment, that it's through crazy emotions. And there may be a bit of truth to that. So I'm, I'm being a little self-serving when I want to look at today's topic of the rage economy because I'm having my own self-reflection, right? Of should this be a show of rants? Should I get angry about the topics we cover? And I, I'm not so sure. I kind of think while we want to be emotional, we don't need to be raged up. We don't need to be outraged. So I, I want to come back to this article and share, share a few paragraphs from sort of the middle section. Just as the advertising model incentivized news outlets to project a business-friendly view of the world, the new model requires readers to stay not just satisfied, but also engaged enough that they are willing to maintain economic support. Sound familiar in terms of Twitch? Unfortunately for society as a whole, one of the best ways to monetize engagement on the internet is by generating anger and hatred usually directed at some other group of people. This rage-driven model is at the heart of what Mir calls post-journalism. In its most extreme forms, in venues where the old professional ethics and standards of journalism have been discarded or have never taken root, post-journalism will produce mobs whose rage is incomprehensible to their outside bubbles and like the QAnon conspiracy theorists who sacked the Capitol. And while I think that this is alarmist, I think that there are analogies to how, say, for example, here on Twitch, we organize an audience, we get that audience worked up, and then maybe we'll take them on a raid. We'll, we'll help deliver that audience to a friend or a frenemy. And I think, you know, while the there's a moralizing here that I disagree with, there is a politics or a mobilizing to the way in which we use our media that, that I think is, is worth looking at. So I'm going to continue reading. As post-journalism needs to amplify people's frustrations for profit, it spirals up into the amplification of extremes and therefore polarization. The outraged and polarized audience is a side effect of this new business model, Mir told me in a lengthy email exchange. Seeking support from the audience in the conditions of fading attention, the news media are forced to amplify and dra dramatize issues whose coverage is most likely to be paid for. If the ad-driven media of the past tended to manufacture consent, the reader-driven media must manufacture anger. There is no evil plot. There's no liberal bias. There's no right-wing conspiracy. Such are simply the environmental settings for a media industry that has lost its ad revenue and news business to the internet. And that's the paradox, right? On the one hand, we now live in an attention economy where anyone can become a Twitch streamer and compete for other people's attention. But what lengths will you go to in order to get that attention? Right? What extremes will you take? What are the crazy things that you'll do on stream, whether you know hurting yourself, whether abusing yourself, or whether even worse, abusing others or hurting others? And I think that's where it's important to, on the one hand, recognize that emotion is essential because that's the lesson I'm going to take away from this article. Not that anger is something that we need to be successful or gain an audience, but that emotion is important. And that we need to think about the emotional connection that we make with our audiences and the emotional vibe that we want to set as part of our show. Now, here at the Cyberpunk Today show, part of the emotion I'm trying to evoke is angst, right? Is a concern, is a holy shit, the robots are taking over kind of vibe so that you get a little bit worked up. But then we start to chill as we start to unpack and break down that maybe they're not taking over, but they do pose a unique kind of threat that we should be paying attention to. 
And that's why I think the idea of emotion and the way in which emotion is used in media is something that we're going to get into on today's show. I mean, our next segment is about artificial intelligence that has emotional recognition and the way in which this AI is able to use that emotional recognition to potentially manipulate people. But I I wanted to start with the rage economy because that's not about AI. That's about us as humans. That's about us as creators and the way in which we use our emotions to connect with our audience, but also to provoke and, and, and try to mobilize our audience. We see how in the news industry, it's really focused on anger and outrage and kind of getting baby boomers all worked up about, you know, all the crazy things in the world. But we have to ask ourselves, what do we do here on Twitch? And what's the kind of emotion that we use as we try to grow and foster our audience? You know, Merlatron sort of phrased it as attention fracking. And that's a brilliant concept, Merlatron. That's a really fantastic way of thinking about it. Both because uh, fracking involves sort of pumping high pressure liquid into the ground to kind of free up the, the fossil fuels and free up the energy that's there. But fracking also is environmentally destructive and it can create earthquakes that then devastate communities. So, yeah, I mean, the rage economy is like fracking because you don't know what kind of emotions you don't know what kind of rage uh, that might be unleashed. And that is why that uh, attempted fascist coup that that we saw in Washington, D.C. in January is so scary, because when those emotions are evoked, uh, bad things do happen. 